Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. we are back this is the pencil kings podcast and if you want to support us i'm just going to throw this out once again we do have a patreon page up now so it's patreon.com slash pencil kings p-a-t-r-e-o-n and um, what we do there is we actually take what we're learning from these expert artists and then we distill it into text form so sometimes it's a lot easier to have things as a pdf and you can then see how you can apply it to your own career or your own art practice and today we are talking to aaron kufferman and we will have show notes for this if you want to check it out. You can see everything, this episode and everything else at PencilKings.com slash podcast. So welcome to the call, Aaron. I'm happy that we got to connect. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mitch. So to start off, I always ask people this first question. Um, what's kind of a one to two minute overview of what you do, just so that people listening can get a sense of uh, what you're all about right now. And then we'll dive into some actual questions about, about that. I guess my my day job is a uh, is a visual effects compositor uh, on feature films, on commercials, TV, and even occasionally video games. Uh, compositing, you know, it's it's like uh, Photoshop for film, taking all these disparate elements, uh, green screen stuff, computer generated stuff, uh, and putting it all together and making it look like it was all originally shot in the same on the same plate or something and um so you know i've worked on a variety of different projects over the years uh variety of different studios big big projects very small quirky projects um and the other side of me is i do a lot of photography and i've always been a photographer i've always seen you know things through a lens and it's it's sort of my my second my, my private passion that I do. It's it's my it's my pure creative outlet where I don't have five layers of people over me telling me what to do. And that's that's really what I where I get my my creative juices from. So I guess that's uh, that's me. I I I like that distinction where you don't have people over top of you, kind of tinking tinkering and tweaking things where it's just you know like this is me this is a hundred percent me right and i mean i even know like in a lot of forms of art in a lot of creative projects it's really great to have collaboration and i love collaborating with people in my professional world and you know it like there's so many amazing visual effects artists that i've worked with that i learn things from all the time but for me the photography is a very personal thing. I have several friends that I'm, you know, I'm close with that I will go out and shoot with, but still when we get out somewhere, usually we go off and do our own things and we circle back. So like still the, the actual photography part of it, that's me, the camera and the scene, you know, and, and that, that's all. So I, I really, I've always enjoyed that. And even when I was in art school, Almost in between every semester, I would go out on a little photo trip expedition journey somewhere for at least a couple days to a week. And I'd go reset, go outdoors, go backpacking with the camera, go on a road trip with the camera. And that's sort of like that's that's my mental reset. That's just it's and I love the process almost as much or as much as the result, I, maybe even more so sometimes. Like I'll get back. And I'll be like, oh, that was a great trip. I got some awesome photographs. I'll get to those, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, I'll see what I got later, especially in the film. Oh, days. cool! So it's almost like the going out and the physical activity is more rewarding than, or or can possibly be more rewarding than the final outcome. Yeah, it, it can be. It's it's really, and also partially because most of the photography that I do is outdoors. So I also just love the outdoors, and it's my it's my way to experience the outdoors. I mean, I've also though done a lot of uh, motorsports, car racing photography, 
and you know I'll get I, I I've done fully credentialed professional photography at big name you know racing events America Le Mans series and stuff and but then again it's me with earplugs in on the side of a track photographing cars and there's other photographers I know that are out there but I mean the art you know what I'm doing is just me as well. To start off, why don't we go back a little bit and um, explore where you got started? Like, photography has clearly been a, a huge influence and continues to be a huge influence. And you're sort of split in two ways. You're doing the visual effects. I'll just call it stuff, but yeah, you're stuff. doing various <laughs> things in visual effects because it's not not just compositing. You're you're doing a bunch of other things, and and you've got the photography. And where did it all? start? Uh, because I think there's a lot of people listening and they're looking for clues uh, and they find it very inspiring when they hear how other artists got started and they can maybe take some of that and apply it to themselves or at least yeah. feel like maybe they're not weird or alone and that, you but know, because it's not always this clear weird. path. We're all weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, coming out of high school, I was really, I, I've always had a very analytical mind and I was very much interested in going to like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. I mean, you know, I was a president of my high school's electronics and amateur radio club, if that says anything. So, um, you know, but as, you know, when I graduated, I, as my graduation gift, my parents gave me my first camera. Um, an old, this was in 96, it was an old Rebel X Canon, you know, SLR. I almost said DSLR, but no, it was film, SLR. And, you know, I, I started shooting and I started really enjoying it. And, you know, coming out of high school, my grades weren't the best. I went to community college and I took some photo classes and I started really just digging it. And, you know, where the professor would tell the class, OK, you'll have to budget maybe one box of paper for the semester and, you know, maybe budget, you know, 10 rolls of film. I was like tripling or quadrupling that. I was just wow as much as I could and just enjoying it and, and really, you know, just eating it up and dark room, you, you really got to get your, literally get your hands dirty, you know, smell the chemicals. Like those were the glory days of photography, I feel. And I hope that all photography students, you know, anybody who's serious in, in the field really gets a chance to experience that. And over the years I've continued to work, um, even, you know, while I was in school or whatever, I've continued to work at several photo labs, um, working my way up to A&I Photo in L.A. And now they're owned by a different company and everything. But like when I was worked there in 2002, 2003, um, they were one of the premier color labs in L.A. And people would go there for museum for their prints that would go into museums or into galleries. And I was both the, the technical supervisor, but I was also like a printer. And I would get their images, we would drum scan them, and I would go and do all the color balance, balancing and do test prints and print them uh, on the digital in large, you know, digital printer. And you know, just being around all of that with the photography side, I mean, it, just learning color, color science, just seeing such a such a, a subtle level of finesse come out of photos. It's, it's, it's quite, you know, there's a lot you can really get out of that. But, um, so I, you know, going through school, I was always into photography, but I realized like I didn't want to go to school for photography. This is just me. I mean, there's a lot you can get out of that, but just at that time I was like, I don't really want to go to school for this. I want to do something broader. So my brother found a digital media program at Otis College of Art and Design in LA. And he sent me the link and I was like, oh, this sounds sort of cool. You know, they have all this, all this neat ways to do imagery, but, you know, in a computer, in a technical aspect, it's combining the two. So I went to Otis and, you know, it, I will say I've never really been a, a pencil artist um, on a site that's, you know, focuses on pencil stuff. And I did enjoy all the foundation art programs there, though, that they put you through the life drawing, the, you know, all, the, all of the different uh, uh, analog art. I mean, you don't touch a computer, a, a computer your whole first year. And it was a very good experience uh, to sort of get that broader understanding. But I always kept the photography as, as my core. 
but you know, then I went into the digital program and I was going to go into typography, motion graphics, all these things, but I found compositing and it really combined the photography side with the computer side. And, and that really resonated with me. Now, I, I want to ask one question uh, and get your thoughts on this. So when you were working at, I believe you said it was AI um, photography lab or processing lab, do you think that this had a huge impact on you because you were, you know, you said that so many people were submitting their work there to be printed for get their gallery shows and whatnot. So you're just being exposed to, oh, you yeah. know, quote unquote, the best of the best yeah. right from the beginning, even though you could have easily looked at it as like, well, I'm just a, a lowly technician, but it's like, no, you're actually doing like master studies or being exposed to this. And it, that, I don't know. I just feel like that was a really powerful position and that because I see people passing on opportunities because they think, well, you know, it's it's too it's below my level. But it's like, no, you you have the opportunity to be working with great people or being exposed to great right. art or, you know, a great right. experience. Yeah, being in the culture, just being around all of that. I mean, they had some people there who were like, I mean, even though we were doing all the digital printing, they had people there who were doing still the old school black and white and larger printing that was like super expensive, but like these were like the old masters. And then a lot of the, the big name photographers that would come through, you know, you'd see like the print that you just printed or that maybe your supervisor just printed would go off and sell for 40 grand or a hundred grand or, you know, and wow. it's like, wow, I, I just touched that. And now it's, I mean, gloved, gloved <laughs> hands. Yes. But um, like I was involved in that in some way. Maybe I painted the dust off the scan, but hey, you know, I mean, you're around that. And that's also where at the time I got into medium format photography and started shooting like lar much larger film because I was surrounded by all these. Everybody who worked there was also a photographer. And so not only was I learning from them on, on the printing side, but also on the on the photography side. And they just mentored me up you know, and, and just refine my skills. So that was, you know, that was a really, really big part. And, and that was while I was in art school too. So that was really, really nice. So I got to ask one question. It's a little bit unrelated here, but a photograph sells for 40 grand or a hundred grand, but it, it can just be duplicated. But is it the value because it's just yeah. printed once and then it's yes kind of just no. archived? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, we basically for it to be able to be sold for that amount, the photographer would come in with the archival pen sign it and then that is the edition that is sold so okay because we would do test prints left and right i mean i never took any home but like you know i was printing <laughs> of my 14 test prints that were as just you know the same quality as the 40 by 50 that was signed and sold but that one was signed and you know authenticated whatever I was doing, that was just, you know, work product. And, right. you know, I, I, I heard of the, the head printer would occasionally get one of the big name photographers to sign for him, like in 11 by 14. And, you know, just as a little favor, because they had built a working relationship for a decade or two or something. But, you know, I was in no position to ask for that, but it was just me <laughs> being around it. So, yeah. I feel like there's a movie in here somewhere where there's somebody working in this lab and they're like sneaking these things home and or they've got you know like yeah. millions of dollars worth of photographs in their in their house and it's just for them and they enjoy it. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I, All right, I so got to print a lot of my own photographs. Humongous. I have a 48 by 100 inch print somewhere around here. So you you went to Otis and you got exposed to a broader range. You start to learn a little bit about compositing, which again, for those of you listening that don't know what it is, it's sort of like Photoshop for video, uh, so moving pictures. Um, 
what happened after that? At Otis, they have a, a sort of a senior project that you do. It's sort of supposed to be the culmination of all of the, you know, everything you've learned. And you do a project. So I have a, a good friend who was in the graduate film program at Loyola Marymount. And she was doing her graduate thesis film. Now, previous years, I had done a little bit of visual effects work on her previous films, but we decided to partner up and do like a visual, a film that actually relied on visual effects. And so, well, you know, some other people in my school were doing like, I'll do a project that has like five shots. Like I partnered up with her. We filmed it on 35 millimeter film, got it scanned. And like I had, we had a hundred shots. Wow. And I like, I, you know, I enlisted help from friends to do some modeling and animation of different things. <laughs> and I was able to get some other friends to like come in and even help out with some of the shots. But I mean, I did a lot, most of the work, but like, you know, by the end, like we, we had a pretty decent looking little film there and it was a huge accomplishment accomplishment. It was a big project during the whole year. And obviously doing that, working with the director work, you know, like, that kind of collaboration was really amazing. And at the end of the school year, they have professionals who come in and view work and they'll give students feedback and stuff. And there was a, a an American producer that came in and he liked my stuff so much that at the end of the semester, he came back and he said, so how would you feel about working in China? I was like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. Uh, well, I have a visual effects studio in China and we're in need of a supervisor. How would you like to go to China and supervise? I'm like, well, I'm right out of school, but I mean, I guess he saw something there. So my first job out of school, I, you know, boarded an airplane, flew to China, and uh, uh, I was there for four months and supervised uh, a pretty big film project. It was actually a documentary on the Forbidden City uh, in, in Beijing. And it was all these historical, you know, recreation shots and big set extensions and stuff. And, you know, I supervised all of it. And it was an amazing experience. And then I came back and I was like, well, gee, what do I do now? Because I had sort of lost a lot of the connections. But then, you know, I, I, I had that experience. It wasn't like I was able to come back and start supervising here. But uh, I eventually found some compositing work and worked my way back up here. But, like, I, I had that kind of professional experience and that was just an amazing thing to have that's so cool and you're the second uh we talked to another otis grad and he just hit the ground running right out of school and hearing your story really makes me think that you know whether to go to school or not it's kind of you know up in the air there's you can't take on a lot of debt and whatnot but if you are going to go to school if you can be in that environment where you're exposed to people who could open these doors for you I mean, that that definitely seems yeah. like the way to do it now that, you know, being in L.A. or if New York, if, if that's where those people are that can open doors for you, you know, be in New York. It's, yes, it's expensive to be there and everything, but it can literally shortcut your career probably about five years. I would yeah, you conservatively need, you need estimate a lot of people both in your class and through the school's connections. And that's a great network networking, uh, you know, bonus there. Um, now I will say I, I've seen I sort of have seen two different sides to I guess really any school but but in my case art school is that I have seen some really amazing visual effects artists come through the industry that have never touched art school but they are just awesome artists they have amazing drive great motivation they're able to just go and do their own like like take the the art take the craft and and do it and I've also seen people who have been exposed to the best art school, you know, like experiences you can possibly get. And they, right after school, they go back to doing some other non nothing job. And that entire experience is really for naught. So it really is a lot more about your drive. It's about what you bring to the table. Like, like yeah, that, 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 that's what, that's what makes or breaks you.
yeah, I've, I've thought about this a long time. What is the difference between those who, we'll just call it making the leap, and those who don't? And I think it's drive and confidence. And I think, you know, luck does play a little bit of a part. And then your personality as well. So if you're the kind of person who's easy to get along with and be around, then you're going to yeah. get invited to more things and meet more people. And then, you know, it's just a matter of time before you meet that right person and, and then things start to snowball. Yeah, but also it's all about your drive. I mean, there there are people who the, who I went to school with who really, they figure that things would be given to them or they would be taught something. It's not about somebody teaching you something. It's about you learning it. And if you're not putting it, putting yourself into learning something, you know, anybody can stand in front of you and show you the most amazing techniques, the most amazing tools the most amazing art to get inspiration from. And if you don't do anything with it, hey, you know, that's your money lost. Yeah. So i got to ask uh, a little bit about China. Were you just based in Beijing? Because that's where okay. I kind of got my start was in, uh, uh -oh. first was Xiamen, and then eventually I was in Shanghai for most of the time. But uh... Yeah, um, I was in neither. <laughs> um, I actually um, was in this well, we'll call it a medium-sized city in China of 6 million people um, <laughs> that was about an hour outside of, of Shanghai called Wuxi, W-U-X-I. Yeah, the... Yeah, you, you've heard of it? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, it's a hot place, if yeah, I remember correctly. There's definitely um, there's a lot of technology kind of buildings there and stuff, business, you know, factory stuff. But like, and I, it's, I'm sure it's changed a lot. I was there in 2005. So, but it's very much like I, I spent all day, both days, my first weekend there walking around their downtown and I saw maybe three other non-Asian people. And it was such a, the extreme opposite from a touristy area. <laughs> and yeah, I, was like, I think it still well, is. <laughs> I'm very much immersed. This is about as immersed as you can get. And I can barely speak English. There's no way I could do Chinese. So I really did not like, you know, learn the language and get immersed in that respect. But I really appreciated the culture and also eventually got screwed out of my position and, you know, be very, very, very careful working in China because um, contracts don't mean much. So I'll, that, that, that's, that's a story for another day. But, um, <laughs> You know, it, it wasn't the best ending there, but I had an amazing experience while I was there. And I made an amazing friend there who now owns a visual effects studio in Beijing and has for many, many years. And in the recently, I've actually worked with him on a Chinese feature film, and uh, I supervised it remotely from here. And it's a pretty large, it's a, you know, it's a very large film there. So you know, it turned into future projects. So, hey. Yeah, there's there's a lot of very good and very bad in, in China. That was kind of my experience as well. It's a, a story. Your story sounds uh, similar to a lot of stories that I've heard. So what I want to ask you about is the night sky photography that you're doing and how you're kind of incorporating that into what you're working on these days because I think it's really interesting. And it's something that's fascinating to me that I'll often look up at the sky and at night you see some amazing things. I've seen some meteor showers that are just I, yeah, you look at it and you're like, what is going on? This is the world that I live in? Like there were these phenomena can happen. Um, but then capturing it on film is, or on, you know, digital camera or whatever um, right. format you're using, it's something that I've never, never uh, experimented with personally. And I'm always, I, I love looking at the, the sort of the time-lapse storm photos and, and the night right. photos. So yeah, they're, just they're beautiful. I mean, curious from from your point of view as somebody who's done a lot of it um what do you what do you see in it and, and how are you using it professionally for well definitely not professionally um at least not yet but for most of my i'll call it phot photographic career i've been pretty much completely into still photography and it's really only been in the last um maybe year or so that i've gotten into time lapse and I've definitely have done star still star still photography over the years and I'll do, you know, long exposures, get some really cool star streaks and stuff. But, um, you know, I'm not sure what really got me into time-lapse. I tend to have 
Well, in many respects, I have hobby ADD, and I also have sort of photography style ADD, not style, but I'm always trying and playing with different things. And I'm very much a gearhead. And there's nothing more gear intensive than time-lapse photography, I guess. And I guess I call it photography because I approach it from a photographic aspect, but it's, you know, creates video. So, and then also really finding the night sky as, I, I guess I have found it, the night sky a place that I can turn what the naked eye really can't see too well into almost a magical image. And with a lot of photography, you're capturing what's there. And if you're there with, you know, with your eyes, you see what's there. But with the night sky, you can reach into the colors that are there that your eyes can't see at that darkness. And you can pull those colors back out onto the screen. And it's, it's sort of this magical place. And it's also this, like, it, it's this quiet, you know, serene place as well. And I don't know, I, I've just, have, I've really gotten into it in the last year and I've started to do a lot of these videos and I love moving the camera through this stuff. Uh, I've, I've been trying, I've, I have a 3D printer, I've been 3D printing some camera rigs that I've been experimenting with, but I've also bought some nice high-end camera rigs and I'm just, I'm looking for more ways that I can move the camera. And while most night sky photography has these stars in perfect, um, you know, like tack sharp focus, I've been doing a lot of stuff where I, I put the stars out of focus and I'm focused on the landscape in front of me, the, the, the plants, the really cool, interesting foreground subjects. And I'm actually convolving, you know, defocusing the stars. And it's, it's just a different look on things that I've really been enjoying. There's one photo in particular that I want to ask you about, which uh, it, in your current state of your website and your gallery, which is AaronKupferman.com, it's like a vortex where it looks like the moon is kind of coming up uh, as well, or maybe going down under the uh, behind the silhouette of some mountains. It's the third image, and it's like a I want to call it a spiral uh, path, yeah. but that's, that's not yeah. what it is. But what can you explain the third this photo? Image because on the, on the night sky portfolio, I just pulled it up here. Yeah, that's the moon rising. So it looks like a vortex because on the left side is the is Polaris, is the northern sky, uh, northern star. And that is, you know, in the northern hemisphere, what everything rotates around. Well, we rotate around it. And that's about maybe three, maybe two, three hours worth of movement. And that's the moon rising over the mountain. And that's the moon streaking across the, the, the sky in a time lapse. And then you take all the time lapse photos and you stack them. And then you get these nice star trails. There's just all sorts of amazing things you can do with this stuff. I've, I've just really been getting off on it you know yeah i'm just yeah i'm just pausing here to look a little bit closer I, at first i didn't recognize the north star but there is like a one single point um within that's you know there's one star that's in focus and everything else are, are these um curving streaks it's, it's i don't know i, I think yeah. it's amazing yeah it, it's beautiful stuff i love it i just I, I love you know shooting it and coming back and then seeing what you can do with it pushing it and and yeah, just getting the Milky Way in there and getting it to light up and everything. It's, it's, it's beautiful. All right, there's time for one last question here, and it might be, I'm sure we could probably talk for 10 hours about this question, but um, I, I still want to ask it, because you spend so much time 
with photography and film and considering the frame. Um, and for those of you listening, just to explain, the frame is, you know, the, the border that contains whatever image that you're working on. So composition is obviously very important, but I feel I feel that as visual artists or, or um, visual artists is too broad, but somebody who's drawing or painting, we're not spending as much time considering the frame. And I'm generalizing here, of course, uh, as somebody who's doing photography, because with photography, it's that's like the a huge part of the game. And so what have you learned or, or what are some of the things that you see? Um, I, I guess I'm curious, what do you see people doing improperly or where they could maybe improve in terms of composition um, because you've spent so much time uh, considering this? Yeah, I, I think um, really no matter what you're doing, what form, your composition is, is the most telling aspect of your art. I think even it could even be more so than, than some of the content and you know, there's all the rules of thirds or the, these golden whatevers. I mean, I don't even know any of that stuff. Um, purposely brain fleshed it, but I, I think for me, what most, what I see a lot of people not paying attention to are the edges. And it actually it was sort of funny because I was, I showed up at a friend's wedding. I wasn't actually there as an official photographer, but I had a camera with me. And I always take a camera. And, you know, the parking attendant saw me unloading on my camera gear. And he came up to me. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm into photography, you know. Like, if there's one thing you could tell me, like, what, what is it? I'm like thinking, oh, that's, that's okay. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know what? Your edges are more important than where you're, you place things within the image. Because if you have something that's sort of sloppily close to the edge or you have some bright, you know, little like sliver of something that's just in the corner or, you know, uh, you, you have some aspect of something that's, that's sort of awkwardly off to the side. It's not cut out, but it, it doesn't have breathing room off of the edge. Like that throws me off so much and I can, I can really tell pretty quickly how much experience somebody has with photography, with image making by how they treat their edges. And, you know, in drawing, if you're approaching an edge, you can maybe shorten something or lengthen something, but you know, like ha being conscious of that is, is really key. And like with photography, if I have a really great image, I may spend, spend a lot of time really focusing on exactly where I'm going to put that crop line because there may be something up in the top corner that I want to include, but then if I slide it that far over, I may cut something else off in different ways, so like really finessing your crop, your edges. Like for me, just really tells how much refinement you have in your work. And walking or like – you know, one exercise we did in school is taking an empty 35 millimeter slide frame and walking around and just holding it up and looking through it like that's your lens. And it's just a great exercise for anybody, really, who, who wants to learn composition. Not, not a camera, just a little square cut out of a piece of cardboard, even. And just really considering every little, every little thing in that, in that frame. And... You know, I actually that sort of gets to you know one other point I I'd like to make is you know no matter what art form you are doing it, it's it's you're finding a different language to to speak the same thing the, the thing is art and whether it's you know a camera or a pen or a piece of software it's all you know, you could spend all this time learning the language, learning how to use a camera. And you could spend all this time learning paintbrush techniques or learning a software like Nuke or After Effects or whatever, Photoshop. If you don't have, you could even learn some words, string them together into sentences and maybe even make some paragraphs. But if you don't have anything interesting to say, you know, what are you doing learning that language? And... Like, like so many people are fixated on the language 
people will, will, will ask me, oh, that's a beautiful photo. Like, what camera did you use? Really? I mean, <laughs> that's like, that's like, oh, that's almost offensive. You know, like you go up to somebody on the street who's drawing a sketch of somebody. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Let me see this paper. Man, let me see your pencil. You know, <laughs> and I think people focus way too much on the language, on, on the technique, on the on the technicalities. And they forgot to forget about what they're what they're doing. Definitely. Yeah, I, I now that you say this, I, I I've been guilty of, of that before. I think I, I may do that <laughs> if I if I met a photographer because I know so little uh, well, about photography. Yeah, but yeah. when you take it to the Photoshop level, I know there's people always asking, wow, what brush did you use? And I mean, there's, there's I see there's all a, these brush forum, packs everywhere. And, right. There is one forum where it, it, there is a there is a, a context in which you can discuss technique. Absolutely. You have to. It's an important part of what you do. But that has to be understood as that is one part of it. And yes, you have to understand the language to be able to, to write poetry. But, you know, you have to understand its place. You have to realize where it sits in the, in the hierarchy of art. Yeah, it could be, you know, the best technically executed piece, but, which I've seen a lot of this. Um, but it's just not interesting. It just kind of everything looks the same. You know, there's such a high degree of uh, rendering that I see a lot of people doing, and it's like, yeah, it's great. You know, it, it, you'll definitely always be employable. Right. Um, but then there's other people who maybe have something that's really sloppy, or it looks sloppy. You know, when you first look at it, but you can't you can't help but feel moved by it in some way because that image is speaking to you. You know, there's something special about it, and um, I feel like it's hard to explain just with this audio format, but if we were, ab were able to compare a bunch of images, and I would, wouldn't want to call anybody out, but you could definitely, when you're comparing two things, you say, okay, which of these two images is interesting, is more interesting, and then which of these two images is more te technically, I'm using air quotes here, perfect, right, right. and yeah. then there are two different ways to evaluate it. Yeah, exactly. And just about knowing, you know, and, and on the photography side, so many people put so much emphasis on oh man i got to get that better lens you know i've got to get that new piece of gear yes i'm a huge gearhead i have way too much gear ask my wife but it's it's about what you do with the gear and it's about you know like like the gear will get you maybe that extra 5 or 10% in some very niche parts of photography the gear will get you maybe 30% or 40% but you know, you you have to bring the rest as the photographer or as the artist. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when people focus so much on the technical that they forget about the artistic. Uh, if, if we ever do meet in person, I think I'm going to still have to ask you this question just to just to get your goat <laughs> a little bit. Um, that's that's pretty much it for this podcast. Um, any last words before we wrap up here? No, I, I, I think you've got a great collection of all these different interviews i was listening myself and i'm going to keep going through them because you have some great people with really amazing points of view and uh it's a, it's, it's a good resource that you're building here thanks a lot and so aaron's site is aaron kupferman a-a-r-o-n-k-u-p-f-e-r-m-a-n.com i encourage you to go check it out um Actually, one one final question if somebody's listening to this because we generally do you know drawing and photoshop and, and video game stuff. Is there a resource that if somebody is drawing like, hey, after listening to this interview, I feel inspired to learn a little bit more about photography. Where would you send them? Is it just, you know, YouTube or is there uh, somebody that it really that, has, that, you know, yeah, that's a, a good ability question. to take beginners? Uh, oh, okay. Um, I haven't found a good resource for learning the, I guess, an online resource for the, the art side of photography, but the technical side there's a site called cambridge in color and they have some really great pages written out of a lot of the technical side their artistic side of photography is very much lacking but it gets very technical very quickly so it may not be the best site if somebody just wants to learn hey i want to i want to explore photography um i i yeah that's a tough one i don't have a good answer for you sorry <laughs> no no problem. Um, so that wraps it up, and 
I'm, I'm going to plug our Patreon one more time because I really want to be able to support this podcast a little bit more, and, and hopefully we can get to the point where we're doing two episodes a week. So that's patreon.com slash pencilkings if you want to support. Uh, we've got some goodies for you there. So thanks so much, Aaron. I really appreciate it, learning yeah. more about photography. And I, I love that tip about looking at the edges. It's not something that I've heard before. Um, and I love sort of counterintuitive advice because everything is like, focus on what's in the frame. It's like, right. yeah, but you know, go to the edges. So thank you very much. Great. I really appreciate it. Thank you.